Hey there! Today I'd like to introduce you to one of my favorite games that we use to help students break down the wall of green and begin to notice details and identify common plants all around them. We call this game Plant Concentration. Now here's how plant concentration works. In just a few moments, I'm going to reveal to you a collection of leaves and plant parts that I harvested from just right around here in the local park. These are all species of plants that are commonly thought of as weeds and that you're likely to find many of them right in your very own yard at home. Now, I'm going to give you about 15 seconds to take a look at the plants that I've harvested and during that time I want you to take some time, look closely at them, see what you notice. Notice things about their shape, their color, can you tell if they're fuzzy or shiny, any other observations that you might be able to make about those leaves and try and commit those things to memory. Because after I've showed them to you, what I'm going to ask you to do is go out in your own yard and see if you can identify and harvest a few of these plants. Now, one note about harvesting. It's very important that as we approach taking the lives or parts of lives of plants, that we approach things with an attitude of thanksgiving, that we be mindful about caretaking our environments and being good stewards of our spaces. But if we can go out and harvest small amounts of these plants and make sure that we ask permission and are thoughtful about it, this can be a very sustainable practice. So, take a look at a few of these plants that we've got right here. Welcome back. I hope that you were able to find a few of examples of the plants that we had in our collection. But if you didn't, that's okay. I'm going to go through them all now, one by one, and talk a little bit about the plants that we collected and some of the ways that they might be useful. I'd like to start with one of my favorites. This is chickweed. Chickweed is a great winter vegetable that grows up during the late winter and early spring when things are cold and wet. Uh, I often find it growing in clump, clumps and clusters at the base of Douglas fir trees. And one of the things that I find really useful in identifying chickweed is the fact that it's the only plant that I know of that has a mohawk. And what I mean by that is if you look closely on the stem, there's a single line of hairs running up the side of the stem. And then when it gets to this leaf junction, the line switches sides. Now, the other thing you'll notice if you look closely at the flowers of a chickweed is that they appear to have 10 petals. But if you look very closely, you'll notice that there are actually five petals that each look like little bunny ears. Five pairs of petals together. One of the things I love about chickweed is that it's delicious and you can eat this. I'd like to take a look at these two plants side by side. Uh, one of these is dandelion, and one of these is a plant called hairy cat's ear, or it's sometimes known as false dandelion. Uh, they grow commonly all around our area in similar environments. Um, they're both edible, although I find that the dandelion, the true dandelion, is more palatable. Now, when you look at this leaf here, what you'll notice is that it has these deeply incised lobes here that come out the pointed teeth. That right there is the most common pattern that you'll see in dandelion leaves, although they do have some variation. Now, if you look closely at dandelion leaves, they might be very slightly hairy, um, but mostly they don't have a lot of hair and they feel a little bit rubbery to the touch. They also have a milky sap when you break them. The hairy cat's ear is very similar, but instead of having deeply toothed leaves, you'll find that it has these rounded lobes going all the way down the edges. In both cases, the plants have a prominent central spine on the leaf. Hairy cat's ear leaves, as the name would suggest, are a little bit fuzzy to the touch. Okay, I'd like to talk about dandelion for a second. The scientific name of this plant is Taraxacum officinale, and what that means is the official cure for disorders. The reason it carries that name is because during a time in the history of European people, when it was not easy to get fresh 
fruits and vegetables in the wintertime, this was an essential source of nutrients to avoid deficiency disorders. These plants are edible, the entire plant is edible, and they're very high in vitamins A and C and many other important nutrients. You can eat these leaves in a salad, uh, you can uh, take the roots and roast them and make a dark bitter beverage that some people say tastes a little bit like coffee. I kind of think of it as its own separate thing. And I think one of my favorite ways to eat dandelions is to take the flower heads, dip them in a little bit of batter, and fry them up into little fritters. Quite delicious. Let's take a second to talk about nipplewort. This plant right here that has this big bulby leaf on the end, has a narrow stem with a couple of little extra bits of leaf sticking off it, is known as nipplewort. And it's also edible. It's closely related to the dandelion and the hairy cats here. Okay, now I want to show you yellow dock. This plant right here has a large amount of variation in the way that the leaves grow. Uh, but yellow dock is useful for many, many things. Uh, I find it to be a delicious edible green. Also, if you've ever been stung by stinging nettle, uh, you'll find that when this plant is growing up and it has very young leaves, they're tightly curled and they have a little sheath on them that has kind of a slimy, gooey substance. You can put that on stinging nettle stings or other irritations on the skin and it's very soothing. If there's one plant that nearly every student in our programs knows, it's this one. You know, this plant is easily identifiable by its leaves that all grow out of the base of the plant right at the ground. They're long and narrow like this and they have parallel veins or ribs running down the underside of the leaf. Now, this plant is often known as the bee sting plant. It's a powerful astringent and it has drawing force. So when we have things like bee stings, um, it helps tighten up the skin and pushes out the toxin that can cause the pain there. Uh, this is also very helpful in healing minor wounds, scrapes, cuts, abrasions, that type of thing. This is plantain. This plant right here is probably one of the most powerful healing plants that we have growing wild as a weed in many, many, many parts of our area. Um, this one right here is historically known as the plant of Achilles. And in some versions of the story of the Greek hero Achilles, it's said that when he was a baby, his mother dipped him in a vat of yarrow tea, and that was what gave him his invincible powers. And uh, so this plant right here, yarrow, is a powerful healing plant. It's particularly useful on wounds to help stop bleeding, and it has many other medicinal properties as well. Now this one right here is a wild carrot, also known as Queen Anne's Lace. And while Queen Anne's Lace is actually an edible plant, I highly recommend against harvesting and eating it unless you are a very experienced ethnobotanist. And the reason I recommend against that is because this plant can be easily misidentified or confused with some of the most poisonous plants that we have in our environment, <clears throat> including poison hemlock. But when you look closely at this leaf, you'll find that it's very feathery and finely divided and actually looks quite a bit like a carrot leaf that you would get from the grocery store. I mentioned Queen Anne's Lace because I want you to take very seriously the importance of positively identifying anything before you harvest it for consumption or medicine. At our programs, we teach our students to ask twice. We teach them first to ask a reliable adult. And a reliable adult could be anybody who's knowledgeable about plants. Uh, for teenagers and adults, what I often recommend is that they check at least two different field guides or two different sources before eating something that they're not familiar with. After you've asked a reliable resource, you also want to ask the plant. And while plants don't speak English, there's a lot of things we can do to ask the plant whether this is an appropriate thing to harvest. Because even if we know for certain that this is an edible species, it may still not be the case that we should harvest and eat it. There's many considerations there. For instance, ask yourself, is this plant growing next to something poisonous and it may have transferred some of those constituents? Is this plant growing in a place where it may have gotten polluted by runoff from say a road or railroad tracks or a pesticide? Is this the only member or a part of a very small clump of this species in my area and if I take some of this will it have a strong negative impact on the community of plants in that area? So when we say ask the plant, we're really asking our students to consider all of the implications of harvesting this as to whether it's safe for us and it's safe for the environment to take that plant.